want to take over? <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Good morning. And happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. Mother's Day. Our congregation. Are there any announcements from the pews? Yes, Linda. Just a reminder, trustees next Sunday, 9 o'clock. Trustees, 9 o'clock next Sunday. Audrey. Yes, if you order a carnation to marry your honor of a loved one, please stop and pick it up at the church. Okay. Um, if you have to pay me, please pay me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I've just confirmed with John, yes, there will be a, a abbreviated Ad Council meeting next Sunday. Larry and I will not be there. I'm assuming Larry will get out the financial report via email to you. So we will have it, but um, so it should be a shorter meeting than usual. Uh, but there will be one following service, not before service. Um, one more now. What's that? So uh, in the bulletin it says that next, or this coming, you know, twenty fourth of whatever is uh, the delivery for the food pantry. It's not. It's the thirty first of the following Wednesday. So it's one I checked.
God of all time and space, you initiated the relationship of love and generosity with creation at a time before and beyond all knowing. Through the word and the spirit, you continue in eternal love for all beings. Fill us with a deep and abiding awareness of your presence, your call, and your grace in our lives and in our world. Shape us to the people you have given us to be, poured out and created mercy for the sake of Jesus Christ in all creation. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> Thank you.
Now we come to our time in worship where we raise before God and one another our joys, our cares, our concerns. Well, are there any prayer requests this morning? I have a voice. 35 years ago today, I was a very old person in Congratulations. Prayers for my sister Mary, who's in the ICU in Colorado. I don't know if anybody except for a mother. I'm so thankful for the mother I had. Gracious living God, once again, Lord, we have gathered together in this sacred space, in this space, in our special time, to worship you, to praise you, to open ourselves to you, to bow our heads before you, to acknowledge you as God of all creation and Lord of our lives, and yet we are we know we are blessed that you know us each by name, even down to how many hairs are on our heads. And Lord, we are just here to say thank you, to praise you, and give you the honor you so deserve. And it is only one of our ways that we say thank you and honor you. But um, it is special to us. And Lord, as we gather, we gather um, with cares and concerns in our hearts that we know we can place on your altar. For you have heard the prayers of your children throughout generations, and you just add ours to all the others. For you answer in your way and in your time. And we just begin by thanking you, Lord, for the blessing and um, celebration of Cindy and Vic of 35 years together um, in this very sanctuary. Uh, what a blessing they are to us, but what a special blessing you have been to them all these years. And we just ask your continued blessing on them each and every day. And Lord, for, we thank you for the blessing of friends far and near and the ones we have not seen in so long. It's good to have Dennis here. And, uh, uh, Brett and Kelly just feels so good to see them and to have them here and to remember that they are always a part of this congregation and its family. Lord, we pray for Jocelyn and pray that this sort of dental surgery will go well so that she can then be, have to be transplanted out of the world. May this little girl get on with life, Lord. So I pray that you are guiding all the doctors caring for her in all ways and just Watch over her, keep her in your care, and help her to return to fullness and wholeness of health. And Lord, we celebrate with Lois and her cousins um, how good it is to, to reunite with family and to come together once again. Bless their time together this day. May it just be the beginning of many other special memories together as family. Lord, for the McCrutchen family, um, we ask that your spirit brings them comfort and peace this day as they mourn the passing of their loved ones. Um, it, 
is never easy to lose a loved one, and we are just grateful that you are there, and your spirit brings comfort and peace to all bodies that have been touched. So watch over them and keep them in your care. Lord, for Mary, who is in the ICU at this time, we just pray that you are watching over her, placing your healing hand on her, guiding the doctors and the medical staff caring for her, and all ways that she may get through this and return to fullness and wholeness of health. May she feel your presence and feel at peace and blessed. And on this special day, Lord, we ask and give you thanks for our mothers, for the blessings they have been, for better or for worse, in, in, in good times and in bad. Um, our mothers have helped shape us into the people we are. And we are grateful for our mothers, for those who have been like mothers to us, and everyone who has had an influence in making us who we are. So thank you for your blessings in our lives through them. And Lord, there are those who are worshiping with us from their kitchens and from their couches who also have cares and concerns that they place on your altar at this time. Lord, for those who have been named, who need your healing touch, we ask you as our great physician that you will return each one to fullness and wholeness of health. For those who have, may have been named who are grieving at this time, we ask that your spirit bring them comfort and peace. And for those who have just celebrated a joyful moment in life, we thank you for being there, blessing it, making it all the more joyful. And as always, Lord, we pray for this world. Where there is war, let there be peace. Where there is oppression, let there be freedom. Where there's hunger, may they be fed. Where there's illness, may they be healed. To us, through others, may the poor come to know the peace and the kingdom you have come. Through Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation. But deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And one prayer I forgot to add, but I ask that you all keep it in your personal prayers through the week, and that is annual conference, which is next next weekend. Larry and I will not be here. Um, we will be down in Wildwood. It's our first time together as an annual conference since 2019. So everyone is excited to be there. Our first reading today is from the book of Acts, and there's a very strange word in here called the Areopagus. Just know that it's a hill in Athens. It's nothing famous, it's not a port, it's not a, um, anything all that special, it's just a hill, but it's got a name. So, with that, while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to a meeting place of the Areopagus, where they said to him, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting you are bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we would like to know what they mean. All the Athenians and foreigners who lived there would spend their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship, and this is what I am going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. He is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he gives himself, he gives, he, rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and in the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far away from any one of us. 
For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. Now if we could stand and sing number 21, 22, Live in Charity. And there needs to be a little explanation on how we're going to sing this. We'll sing through the refrain first, which is off top. We then sing through verses 1 and 2, one right after the other. Then we'll go back to the refrain, and we'll sing verse 4. That makes sense? Okay.
John 14. And Jesus said, If you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you, and he will be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him, because it, is neither, it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and is in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has, whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. This is the word of God to the people of God. When I was in seminary at Drew, there was one class that I took, and the name was On Death and Dying. And the teacher who taught it had been a hospice chaplain for at least two decades. And in this class, she taught us how to sit with people and comfort people who knew that they didn't have much time left. What I didn't realize when I took that class was that just within a few weeks after it ended, I would lose my own mother. And this class was very important to me and it had an impact on me because I vividly remember one of the classes, the teacher talked about her own journey with her own mother as her mother declined. And she talked about how important it was to have tough conversations. To have the conversations where if there's ever any air that needs to be cleared, let's say. Some guilt that needs to be relieved. You have those conversations, or you have the, just conversations about um, how much they mean to you, you know, true heart to hearts. With her mother, she even had a living funeral where, you know, they helped, you know, called the people and told people to come who were very special to her in her life so she could see them one last time and talk with them and just hear from them. And because of how this, what this teacher taught, I had some of those similar conversations with my mother in those last two weeks of her life. And to this day, they have meant the world to me. So, if you knew you only had a short time left, who would, who or who do you need to talk with? Who would you want to talk with? And what would you want to talk about? I want you to think, I wanted to get you thinking in that way. Because today's Gospel reading in John is part of one such conversation. It's in the Gospel of John, the Last, the last Supper has already happened. Jesus has washed his disciples' feet. They are still sitting around the table. But Jesus knew that his time was coming to an end. And so all that he talked about in these next couple chapters was very important, his final message to convey. And if you remember last Sunday's gospel reading, it was the one just before this, still in chapter 14, and it's in this one of, in my father's house or many rooms, I'm going there to prepare a place for you. It's a yeah, very popular funeral passage. So he, in that part, he has given them comfort. But in today's part, He's starting to give them challenges and commands. And understand that from chapter 14 to chapter 17, scholars call this Jesus' final discourse in the Gospel of John. And so it makes it kind of even more important to pay attention. Now, to get even a, a deeper understanding, other than just the context, you have to understand the Gospel of John, how unique it is. The other three Gospels are called the synoptics. They have to, they're very similar. They're in sync with each other. So they are called synoptics. John stands alone. And one of, the, one of the unique things about John is his use of the word love. Matthew 
uses the word love in his gospel 15 times, Luke 14 times, Mark 7. In John, you will find the word love 39 times. 24 of them after from the Last Supper on. Now, again, I forgot to count how many times you've heard that word. I think at least three in today's passage, in today's short passage. So, as I've said throughout the years, you know, when a word is used more than three times, pay attention. The writer is saying this is important. But one of the important things to realize, too, is that in Greek, there are seven different words for love. There is maternal love, um, brotherly love, friendly love, romantic love, erotic love, God's love, and today's word, which is agapio, A-G-A-P-A-O, which means social and moral love. We don't have a word for this. It is the love that makes you think beyond yourself. It's not the warm and fuzzy. It's social and moral. It's caring about the community you are in or caring about communities and doing what is morally correct. So when Jesus says, if you love me, I will keep my commandments, he's not talking about that warm and fuzzy, oh, gee, I love Jesus. He's, he's talking about understanding the moral and social obligation we have, the love we should have for our communities and our world. And he's like saying, if you believe my way of life is best, you will keep my commandments. There's a meme that goes around every now and then that to me puts this into this concept very much into a contemporary way of thinking, and that is justice is love in action. So think about it. What Jesus did, it's justice is love in action. It's caring about those who need help. And how did Jesus show up? We know this. He healed people. He, he fed people. He touched lepers. He spoke to women. He, he showed compassion and kindness to people in society that that society at the time would ignore, shove to the side. This is how he showed them love all to show them that God loves them. Because they certainly weren't feeling that. They were being rejected over and over again. <clears throat> and this in contrast to the culture he was preaching to. He lived in an empirical time. The Roman Empire had control over most of the known world. And there were agents in every town that that then enforced the rule and the power of the empire, of the emperor. And they had images, carved images of that power to remind people. And let's not talk about the soldiers who would be walking around with their weapons to enforce that power and keep people in line. To them, this was how, this was a type of power that was good, that controlled people, that oppressed people people. And now Jesus has come along and he is talking about this new type of power and that power is called love. It is supposed to be loving those who are oppressed and helping those who are in need. It's a totally contradictory way of life that they are used to. So how do we put love into action? How do we live out this type of love. Well, when the person's easy to love, it's easy to show. And just think about today, Mother's Day. If you're still blessed enough to have your mother with you, what do you plan on doing for her? Or if you think back to when your mother was with, us, with you, what did you do for her, or what are your children doing for you today? It's easy in that, in that kind of situation to show love. Even if a simple gesture of a phone call, of a little bouquet of flowers, if they're far away, whatever. It's easy to show love when the person's easy to love. But what happens with those people who are <clears throat> a little harder to love? Or those who are not so easy to want to extend anything to? And the best example I could think of for this one, um, it came with, I can't remember if it, if it was our 2020, 2012 or 2016 general conference. And 
for those of you who might not know um, Methodist polity all that well, General Conference is our governing body. It meets once every four years. Um, it brings in clergy and laity from all over the world to one location, and they review the Book of Discipline, they vote on resolutions, and this is the body that dictates what, the me what Methodism believes and our rules and our policies. In 2012 or 2016, there was a resolution presented. Now understand right now in the Book of Discipline on the issue of homosexuality, it just states that it is incon in, oh gosh, I can't remember the word, not compatible with Christian living. At that current, at that 2016 or 2012 general conference, someone had presented a resolution that just wanted to say, we agree that we disagree over this issue because there are many different ways of looking at it, of understanding it. That resolution did not pass. Personally, I was deeply disappointed in that general conference. Now, I remember a few weeks later, we had our annual conference where New Jersey churches get together, the one that Larry and I will be at next, next week. Now, I remember sitting around the table at lunchtime, and there were you know, clergy friends, and there were just lady friends sitting there, and one of those lady per people was openly gay. And one of the clergy people went to them, so, you happy you're still Methodist? And this person said, yes. And I remember mumbling, how could you? I'm not even happy about being Methodist at this point. How could you possibly be happy? And they responded that they were going to extend love and show love to all those who oppose them until the day those people see them as a person they are, as a creation of God, as a child of God that they are. Because love is always the answer. When loving gets tough, it has to become a choice, not, a, not an automatic reflex. It's a decision you make. And it's not making this person your BFF, it's not making them, you know, giving them a place on your Christmas card list, it's not, you know, inviting them over for dinner, but it's at least acknowledging that they are a child of God, as much as you are, in whatever capacity they're frustrating the daylights out of you with, and you don't understand them, but there has to be an acknowledgement that God created them as well, and you show them respect. And if they're drowning, you'll throw them a lifeline. And if their house is on fire, you'll call the fire department. This is the kind of social love that Jesus is talking about in the Gospel of John. It's a way to bring unity and harmony to, a, to the world. Now I know you might be sitting there thinking, oh yeah, but you don't know so-and-so who I have to deal with. Yeah, sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it's very challenging to do this. But you have to remember what else Jesus said in today's short passage. He promised that we receive the spirit of truth. This is, this is gearing up for Pentecost, which is, by the way, May 28th, folks. So this is all gearing up to Pentecost, where we receive the spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit within us. And on top of that, Jesus said that he said he will be in the God, in God, he will be in the Father, and we are in him, and he is in us. Did you catch that amazing trinity? Jesus is in God, and we are in him, and he is in us. I know it's not the trinity that the church has, has preached and taught for generations, for centuries, but it is a trinity that Jesus brings, talks about at least twice, in this passage and in John 17, which to me is another uniqueness of John. In it, he's trying to get us to understand the divine side of ourselves, the divine side of us, how we are connected, we are in God, God is in us. And, and to live into that, 
because we know nothing is impossible with Christ. And so when we feel challenged, we should be asking for help. When we, and we will find that strength, that wisdom, that whatever we need to make the decision to love and how to do that. Because that's what Christ was talking about in his final hours of life. That's how important this is and was to him. Have you ever considered yourself the one? Have you ever thought of yourself as connected to God and in God and God in you? It can be a little unnerving if it's the first time you've ever considered that. But I, I encourage you to think about that and, and try to flesh out all that that possibility makes. Because this is what Christ promised. And this is what Christ showed us. And he knew it would be challenging to change the world. But he also reminded us of this connection to him. And all he's asking us to do is to love this world to peace. May it be so. Amen. Amen. <clears throat>
we know motherhood is a wide spectrum, and our life together is a big enough to stand in solidarity with all mothers. For the seen and unseen grief and struggles of women and mothers, we aid with you. For the seen and unseen joys of motherhood, we rejoice and celebrate with you. Mother God, bless all women on this special day.